see if we get some audio now. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. We should be. Well, I'm not sure if I'm even doing this right, to be honest with you. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, I can hear myself now. So, I was trying to figure out how to get this audio to work. Total noob when it comes to live streaming. Was going to do a Twitter space, but I said, well, just watch the rest of the day. Give you your second uh, live stream. We'll talk about this morning. <clears throat> I'm looking for the opportunity for it to drop down to go below that 4105 and a quarter level. I was running FIB projections for targets uh, earlier at the beginning of the stream, and that's what I have down here. I talked about, I think, 40, 40.98.50, I think it's what I tweeted. I don't know for certain off the top of my head. That was a number that I was thinking was doable, but running the numbers here on that FIB, taking this price like from here to here, I'll show you again real quick. One standard deviation, basically a measured move using this high down to that low, this low being a fulcrum point. Um, just because I'm measuring a, a high to a low like that doesn't mean, oh, it's going to definitely go to that level here. It has to obviously continuously prove that it wants to keep going lower. And it first has to break below that low. And again, that's the fulcrum point. So whatever move it has done from that low to high, it's like a measured move idea. And swing down to like that. I got this from th that series from Larry Williams from 1995. He had this little transparent piece of plastic that had several lines on it. One, two, three. He had four, had four lines and a straight line in the middle. Um, he called it his target shooter. And I just basically said, well, I'm just going to use the, the perfect measure move here, and that'll be my target shooter approach with just using the FIB tool. 
create at this level here. I'd like to get another partial off there. So I talked about last night in the what was it the market review that um, new week opening gap, which is abbreviated as NWOG. I know it seems like I'm trying to confuse you. <laughs> I'm not. It's just, it's easier to do these little small letters to describe a, a concept that has a lot of words that just makes it easy. And also, it's real quick for me to type it when I'm doing live examples and I'm trying to record them for Twitter. It's easier for me to type those letters and you know exactly what I'm looking at or what I'm referring to versus sitting here trying to type the words and then most likely probably getting it wrong. Then my obsessive compulsive flares and the whole time the market's moving and I'm trying to focus on all that. It's, it's, it's a little bit more difficult than it probably looks. Small little volume and balance in here. I'm watching that. What's nice is you guys can actually turn this into real high definition and then zoom in on the chart. So whatever doesn't appear all that crisp and you know, easy to see, you can zero in on an area and just zoom in with your phone or your screen on the computer and see real, real close and real tight. <clears throat> I was saying the uh, the new week opening gap last night on the live stream. Oh, not the, well, I guess yeah, I guess it was a live stream on it. The the levels I had on the chart, and I was referring to it as the new week opening gap. I was half right, meaning that I was showing this level here and the midpoint between that level, which is the high on the new week opening gap, which is technically Friday's closing price, and this level here, and then I split that in half, and it was the midpoint of that which is the upper quadrant of the entire range of the new week opening gap. And I had forgotten that I was talking to my son about it, and I had that chart annotated with that, focusing on that specific range, teaching him. And when I opened up my charts and started doing the live stream last night, I saw, I was like, oh, this is on the wrong one on the hourly chart. And I realized really what I had done. So I immediately went onto Twitter and tweeted the entire gradient new week opening gap. So that way you can see each level. And all that is is simply taking a fib and laying it on the low to the high, finding 50%, and then from 50%, lay a fib there to here, and then 50% behind that. Or you can just simply do a 25, 50, and 75 level on your fib, which is simply going in and changing the settings. Just a little bit more, honey. Just a little bit more. It's like my wife, she wants me to give her money. Just a little bit more, honey. <laughs> to which I say, just a little bit more, honey. <laughs> no ratchet ICT here. Come on. Here we are. One more time. There we go. Very, very nice. Can I have a little bit more below it? So now what I'm looking at, since I already had this target hit, I'm looking at this one here. And I have two contracts remaining. I don't necessarily need to have the 40.9850 or the 40.99 level. Um, for moral victory, it would be nice to see it hit there today because I can say, well, there you go, screenshot that, and there's some more evidence. But what I'm wanting to do here now with the two remaining contracts that I have on is I want to eyeball and see if he can go to the midpoint between this target, which has been met, and I took a partial at, and this level here. So if it can reach down to about halfway, I'll close one more. And notice I'm not worrying about my stop loss up here, way up here, completely out of mind. I'm not worrying about it. It's not a point of concern. I'm focusing on price action because this is a really weird, fickle day today. And this morning, 
uh, this is for the, the jokers that like to come in after the fact when they haven't posted anything live, they haven't caught anything live, they don't show any of their examples or executions, and they go on their live streams and lose $15,000 max loss on their live stream and think that they're somehow a mentor. But when I'm tape reading, I'm taking your attention into specific PD arrays, and I'm telling you what I want to see. That's not the same as thing. It's just not the same as going in and taking a trade. They're not trades. Okay, I'm not. I'm not getting wrecked. Okay, I did get on a, a trade this morning, and it did come against me, and I closed it. And if I would have held on to it, it would have stopped me up with a larger stop loss. So, I wanted to engage that way I could have something for you, but it just was simply not wanting to pan out. And also, I like to take a trade when I don't really have a good feel. For what it is I'm looking for, so I'll put on a very small trade, usually one contract, maybe two to get me wanting to feel closer to what price is doing. And this is also something you want to do with your demo account. Even when you start trading with live funds, you should have your demo account at, at, at the ready because in the beginning, if you're trading in the morning session, it can be really indecisive. Even though you may have a bias like we outlined this morning, I was expecting an opportunity to go short. That was the real main focus, but I don't mind taking a long to ride up into that 4070.25 level, which could have very easily been rated. I was looking for that trade specifically to go short at, and I was going to try to nail down the high today so I see, so I can get on Twitter and gloat. <laughs> That's what I was trying to do, but it wasn't it wasn't working for me. It wasn't trying to get up there. So it is what it is. It, it didn't deliver. It didn't go there. But when I'm calling out specific PD arrays, your attention is placed on that specific area. Now, some of you, and it's probably the ones that are real quiet today, you probably looked at that and think, oh, it's a trade. Let me go in there and push the button. And you've learned a valuable lesson today. I told you not to take trades on the things I'm telling you because you don't know what you're supposed to be deriving from that until you go through it. So as I was calling through the, the motions this morning, uh, my son's sitting next to me. He's like, Dad, like, I'm trying to close my eyes and listen to what you're doing because you're, I'm, I'm saying it out loud. I'm saying it out loud and you're just basically seeing a tweet. So he's trying to feel out what it would be like for all of you. You're, you're seeing a tweet, you're seeing levels and things I'm referring to, but you're only seeing one piece of it because I'm forcing you to go into the chart and look at it, engage that very candle, that very concept and try to get a feeling for what you think price is going to do next. The uncertainty, you have to embrace that. You have to, you have to do that part. And it's, it's a scary feeling, especially if you're trying to do it with a live account, which is why you don't want to do it like that. And you shouldn't be done with a demo account either. You want to read the tape, get a feel for what price is doing. And just simply because I'm calling out a level, we're waiting for certain things to occur. A fair value gap doesn't always necessarily mean once it trades down to it, it's a buy. Sometimes I want to see it trade down to it and through it and come back up and act as resistance. But when I key your attention up to it, that's, that gives you time. It gives you time to, okay, this is, this is what we're focusing on right now. This is where our point of interest is, and let's see what he says next. So one of the things you're going to fall victim to is fearing missing out a move, Well, like today. So I know, listening to my son, he was thinking, like, Dad, what do you what do you think the number of traders were today that were trying to do something with everything you were tweeting? I said probably about 30% because they've seen me calling certain things pretty consistently. And knowing what human nature is like, they're going to want to try to pursue you know, the next move. And I started feeling guilty about it. So much so that I was like, I'm going to have to break a rule and just simply call it out plainly when I'm going to take the trade. So I tweeted, said I was going short, and apparently the entire world was listening, and they all dogpiled on top of it. So I think that was interesting. But the, <laughs> the uh, that should have fixed your boo-boo, okay? If you've followed me this morning and you're trying to press the button prior to that, that should have corrected you. Or here's the worst thing. You didn't do that because you hurt yourself doing something you shouldn't have done. And then you watched it do this. And now you're feeling the very things I talk about in my Twitter spaces. The psychological effects of all that stuff. Watch that midpoint between those two levels. 
as I'm talking, my eyes right in between. I know it's probably going to jump down there while I'm doing this. So right here and here. So halfway between that. This is what I'm looking at right here. So 41.03 and a quarter. If it touches that, then I'll peel off one more. It may not do it. I could be wrong and it goes the other direction. I don't care. But I like the idea that we trade up into the volume imbalance I mentioned live here. And we've delivered away from that. We had a sell side imbalance, buy side inefficiency. We came up into that, left a small portion open. I like that. We're in, we're in new lows, but I only have two contracts left. So I'm willing to risk it for the biscuit of hitting down a little bit deeper for here and then getting out on that one. Got to risk it for the biscuit. Just a little bit more ICT. Just a little bit more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this cherry picked. Is it live or is it Memorex? Uh-oh. I'm showing my age. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about, ICT? Older folks know what I'm talking about. Is it live or is it Memorex? Mes uh, was it Mem Memorex? Memorex, yeah. Come on, man. Get this take the profit thing here. All right, so if I want this level, I'm going to come off of it one tick. And then uh, we'll see what we get. Take that off. I want to come in here a little bit tighter and show you that volume and balance. So when we're watching price action, and I'm on Twitter and I'm calling you know specific things that draw your attention to, this is the equivalent of majority of what you're seeing tweets about. Okay. So if I'm looking at say, well, for instance, this volume imbalance right here. Did you see me take a trade there? Did you see me enter it? No. It's something for you to watch and measure order flow. Order flow is how you're reading how price moves from one level to another level. I outlined between this level here and this level here. I wanted a 50% level of that, which was what? 4103.25. What's the low of that candle? You're looking right up here, okay. The low of that candle comes in at 4103.00, okay. So because I was doing it manually and doing it as it hits it live, I aim for trying, it's like a, it's, it's, that's the part of the game I use when I'm doing my manual exits. Because I know I'm invariably never going to get the perfect, the perfect exit point if I use my limit orders on a specific level. Because I've been accustomed to being, unfortunately, permit me to say this without seeing it as an invitation for you to be critical to yourself. But I don't like when I use a limit order when I'm trying to be very, very precise with a, like if I'm trying to get the low or the lowest tick, I'm very, very frustrated when my limit orders don't get it and it goes past it by you know, three ticks or just one handle. So what I like to do is I like to see when it happens live and then I try to time it. It's kind of like that game uh, when I was, when my kids were little, they used to want to go to that Chuck E. Cheese thing and there was a game it would spin around like, well, nothing's really spinning. The lights would go around like it was spinning. But uh, you have to time it. You got to hit this thing, and wherever it stops, you would get that you know, respective prize, whatever it was stopping on. So it's, I treat it like that. So I'm trying to hit it like as it hits the level I'm interested in, I'm hoping that I'll have positive slippage in my favor and then give me the better exit. And sometimes, sometimes my exits are very nice. I'm, I'm satisfied with them. But most of the time, they're not. Like, I'm not satisfied with them. You look at this and you're thinking, well, what are you complaining about? 30 years of trying to pursue perfection. And it's a compulsive tendency for me to 
criticize my own exits. Being profitable is not the point. The point is, is I want them to be perfect. And I'm never going to have that. But as long as I keep aiming for it, what is it going to do? It's going to make that skill set better. It's going to make it better each time. Now, see, I'd like to have more than one contract on still. Because then I could take off one more as it was hitting that low here. This low comes at same level, 4103 even. So now when we have levels like this, see these wicks here? We have the wick there, this wick there, we have a wick here and here, and it's just one single candle. I don't want to see it trade back up into that area. I want to see it remain heavy because we've had multiple times passing through that range, so it should act as a balanced price range and not want to go back up in there. Because if it does trade back up in there, then it's probably going to have a deeper retracement and come back up into this area, which in my mind is problematic for me getting to my target, which is within an earshot of where it's at now. So when I'm calling out PD arrays, specific fair value gaps, volume imbalances, I'd like to see it do this, I'd like to see it do that. The worst thing you could do is read into that thinking, oh, he's communicating that's a trade entry. So the, so the goober out there that's an S&P uh, specialist, you know, Mr. Uh, Talker, that I did not fail and blow out three times in Robin's Cup. <laughs> Fools. Every time I mention a PD array, every time I do that, it's, sim it's simply me giving you a reference point like I mentioned here on this one, talking about the volume imbalance, just like I was calling it live in yesterday's market review. I was talking about very specific things. Watch the reaction to price. And what you're doing is, is you're measuring does price, does it respect that? Now, what would have happened if it would have traded through it? Am I going to go into a, a, a tissy fit? And say, oh, and huff and puff and be mad because it didn't respect that PDA right? No. I'm taking that as insight. I'm reading it, internalizing it, and saying, okay, it went through that one. So what's the next one I have to be watching? Because if it, if it breaks through three of them, then I'm probably not on side anymore. And my interpretation of order flow is not accurate. So if I have a stop loss that's likely to be hit, I can do what I did today and neutralize it and not let the stop be hit at all. Now see what we're doing here? We're trading up into this area, which is what I said I didn't want to see it do. Because it's doing this and trading up into here, my eye is right here at the mean threshold of that candle, this up close candle. So for specifics, I can't tell if it's a five or not. Old eyes. Yeah. 41.07. 0.50. If it goes through that, then I'm probably going to close the trade and be content with it. And that's that. So these are the things that plague me as a, as a trader. I'm wanting to see certain things be given to me at my exits. Let's go back down then. Now, you, it, what happens if it goes down and hits my level and keeps on going lower? So... That's, that's the part that I don't feel frustration for. It's when I'm really trying to key up on, like what I was doing in front of you here, managing and trying to get the, the levels that I wanted for precision. Closing the trade because it doesn't any longer hold the likelihood of delivering like I want to see it deliver. That rule has served me more and better than me trying to be finicky and try to finesse my exit strategies pursuing per perfection. Meaning that if I'm in a trade and I'm looking for something to 
indicate to me that I'm probably no longer in a move that's going to sustain and continue to my objectives. This still could do that, and I'm okay with it because there's many times where I would have discounted that whole idea of saying, okay, if it goes through that mean threshold here, I'll be willing to sit through it, and it might do what it's doing right here, and then all of a sudden go the other direction. And then I would be really upset with myself that I knew better, but I didn't engage on that. I would be mad about that. But I don't get mad about me doing this, closing the trade because it's now meeting a criteria that means that I have been hurt in the past by not sticking to that rule over something so insignificant as a move from where it was and trying to get down to my objective. So it looks like it might hit that 4098.50 level. So reading and interpreting each individual PD array helps you without having to have any kind of like depth of market on the right hand side, you know, there's ladders and such, um, or volume profile. You don't need any of those things. You just need to see does price continuously keep offering resistance in the form of the PD arrays, the things that would key up a new trade, not necessarily that we're taking a trade or that I'm entering on a trade, like the volume of balance that was mentioned here watch that. Did you hear me say go short? Now, some some of you probably went short there and you probably already took profits based on the lines that's already been here and me closing my trade and you probably mimic that and you're doing everything wrong. But every time I mention a specific element of price action and the things I'm teaching you, you're looking at that and seeing how does price react to it. Now, the reason why I'm teaching this and teaching this way of doing it is because you don't know, I don't know, which specific model or approach and what is your multiplier going to be. What's the PD array that you're going to use continuously more than anything else? Is it really a fair value gap, even though you probably have warmed up to the idea because of what I shared and what people are, are you know, making money with now? But that might not be the one you settle in on. It might be a volume and balance. That's your pattern. That's the thing you look for. That's the thing that gets you in a trade. But you won't know that until you do what? Have someone that's going to be identifying them real time, whether it be like this or whether it be on my Twitter feed where I'm calling out the specific candles, saying, okay, note this one, pay attention to this one. That's not an invitation to buy or sell. That's not what that is. Clearly, you can see if I want to tell you I'm going to be in a trade, I did it today. I don't want to do that part because you're not going to learn anything from that. By watching price and seeing which one of these PD arrays, breaker, order block, fair value gap, optimal trade entry, institutional order flow entry drill, mitigation block, whatever one that you see when I call it out, it will repeat over and over again. The ones that you see clearly, that's easy. Oh, I saw that. I was looking at that. I knew he was going to mention that referring to myself when I'm talking about it, then that's the one you're probably most suited for. And doesn't that make much more sense learning from someone that allows you to bring something of your own personality, your own comfort, your, your observations are peaked around a specific element in price action that makes sense to you versus me saying, listen, you're only going to be able to trade the fair value gap. This is the only way you can make money. That's too dogmatic. And sometimes I can come across like that in some of my animated lectures and talking points. But I'm a realist, and I understand that that's not going to fit everyone. You're all going to have your own personalities and quirky little things that you bring to your trading. And you have to make allowances for that. And I certainly have to do so as a mentor, as an educator. Um, it's a testimony to a, a good teacher that you give the student – the opportunity to discover themselves using the concepts, using the principles that you're, you're teaching. So that way it allows them to feel confident in themselves because they brought their own expression, if you will, or personality and internalization of price action, but using the same tools. It allows you as the student to be more hands-on on the actual development of the model versus me saying, here's the only way you can trade my concepts, which is never going to happen. There's lots of different ways to do what I teach, 
and each one of you can have a completely unique model using the same stuff I've taught. It sounds crazy, I know, like it couldn't possibly be like that, but it is. And you want to have a mentor that's going to be able to give you that opportunity. And unfortunately, there's so many copy me, you know, mimic me, you know, come here, we'll have somebody that's going to earn your funded account for you, or you don't pay. <laughs> You've seen those ads yet? Yeah. I think they changed it to, if we don't get you funded, uh, you'll get free signals from the guy that's going to do it for you until you do. Well, that sounds less than a refund, right? <laughs> anyway. So, um, all the things that I was calling out this morning, every individual PD array, that... Uh, That skill set that you're looking for as far as reading price, the days I'm not live streaming, and there'll there'll be times in the sessions that I won't be active on Twitter. And like I didn't want to really do anything today because it feels like someone's sitting on my forehead. Like I have a lot of pressure in my sinuses. And it's probably more information you want to hear about, but I just don't feel well. But I know that Friday's tomorrow, and if I am getting ill. I'm going to be more inclined to want to stay in bed tomorrow, and I won't be able to hit the second live stream that I promised you that we would have each you know, each week going forward. So here I am doing this one. So I'm going to kind of incorporate a little bit of a review in this too, so kind of like two birds of one stone type thing, kind of like what I did last night. But when we have um, time away from each other, when I'm not talking to you via Twitter and when I'm not doing a live session, you want to be doing live tape reading when you can. And if you can't, then you do it with old data that you preferably recorded live on your screen. Let's let it record all day or watch it on market replay, which is unfortunate because that's not the same as watching the candle form. You know, every time it goes up, it just created you know, the equal. Now you went higher, higher, higher. Then it comes off that high. So you don't get that, but market replay you get, the open, one little change, and then it closes and goes to the next candle. And that's the same thing. So there's like only like two fluctuations per candle in trading views market replay, which to me, next to nothing, it's good, but it's better to use a resource where you can record your screen and let the chart just paint you know, while you're sleeping, while you're at work, while you're at school, while you know, whatever you're doing. And that way you can come back and study it real time. And pause it. When you think you see something, pause it, screenshot that, annotate it, and then let the chart or let the chart paint going forward again. And that is the best way that you can do. If you're not watching it live, that's the best way of doing it. So if you're, I guess, capable of using OBS, which I'm still fumbling around with, that's what I'm using to to live stream. It tends to be like the most popular medium to use, I guess, but I'm not an expert in it. But I think it was pretty easy to get to this part, so you can record your screen with that, and it didn't cost anything. You just download the, the app off of the internet, and then just record. Set your charts up, set them up to record, and just go do whatever you're going to do, whether it be sleep or work. And then when you come back, Sit down, roll your sleeves up, and you're in comfort of looking at the charts where you're under, you're not distracted, you're not worrying about what I'm saying, and probably maybe you do that on your weekends instead of watching you know, the football games and golf. Why do people even watch golf? Like I, I get the fact that you know dudes want to go out there and hang out and you know talk it up, but I can't I can't get into that. Like I don't even see that as a sport, but. Instead of doing those things on the weekend, and please don't get at me because you probably like golf and such, but I don't even know why that jumped in my head, but I, I, I'm not a big sports fan. And I just think that the weekends are wasted on that type of thing. And if you're doing that this year, you're wasting really good opportunities. Watch this area over here, the remaining balance of that gap. Between that high. In this low 
that little tiny area? Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Because this is for a gentleman I promised I would talk a little bit about today. If we are, let's assume for a moment that you were expecting price to go down to that 4103 level, okay? And you saw this setup up here. You saw price trade up into this fair value gap. Let me move it away so you can see it. This candle's low, this candle's high, and this candle passes through between the previous candle's low and the next candle's high. There's no overlap of this candle up inside that range until we get to here. So that little shape area that I put on my charts that my students do now too, that little area is where if you were looking at a paint roller and the paint roller applies paint to the wall, rolls down. This little area is like a pocket of where the paint wasn't really thick. It wasn't evenly distributed to the wall and the wall would be like this chart canvas. Okay, if there was no charts on this at all, it would be a blank canvas, like a wall before the painter puts the roller and delivers the paint on the wall. Well, as it drops down like this from here to here, this is where, like when you take that roller, if you ever painted anything or watch a, a painter you know, use a roller, when they first apply that roller to the wall, the paint is really thick. It's, it's ample. It's delivered abundantly to the wall. And as that roller continuously rolls in the direction it starts rolling in when you first apply it to the wall, eventually there'll, there'll be small little porous little pockets where paint did not distribute to the wall. So the surface of the wall will have what? Little spots. And that is much like what we're seeing here where the paint comes in, it applies to the wall, keep going down, keep going down. But now if you look back, there's a small little area here where in an ideal world, the painter would take that roller, apply more paint to it, and then do what? Roll back up over top this little area and this little area. And then he can move on to another area of the wall where he hasn't painted yet. Does that make sense? To me, that makes sense as, a, as an analogy, because if that would have been taught to me when I first learned how to read price action, it would have made a whole lot more sense versus overbought, oversold, you know, what swing high is the real one with divergence and what trend line do I use? What's my moving average settings? You know, what RSI settings should I have my set on? You know, what, do I use MACD a histogram or do I use the moving crossovers? <laughs> All the stuff that was a waste of my time. These are the things that would have been more beneficial to me, which is the nuts and bolts of price action. So looking at where the, the market can go back in and do what? Replenish paint to the canvas. Put put more paint back in an area where it needs it. So when you look at price action and you identify these little areas like this, you think it's going down here. See, the painter needs the paint down to this level here. To, to finish the job, the price run, the algorithm will want to go down there. But it has to do what? It has to deliver the market efficiently. Otherwise, it's a straight line like CPI. When that When that market data comes out, what happens? Market's just doing nothing until CPI number. All of a sudden, you have a, a vertical line. That's it. That's it. It's, it's, all you have is a vertical line that keeps expanding. You can't trade that. You can't do anything with it except for regret that you were in the trade. It's not going to respect your stop loss. It's going to laugh at you. It's going to literally make you feel like you're a fool and you should have never done that. And you should feel that way because the CPI is an absolute freight train like you're literally trying to play chicken with a freight train it's coming right at you hit me it will stand on those tracks it will do that and drag you for miles okay until your account's gone or you lose your sanity so you have to know where price is going to go much like the painter when he looks at that wall wherever he's going to start with whether it be the left side of the wall the uppermost part of the wall or the lower part of the wall wherever he starts okay that's the point of inception. When he puts that paint on the wall, now his job's begun. Now he has to paint the entire surface. 
just watch anybody. Just go on YouTube, say uh, painter using a, 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 a paint roller, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about in an analogy where let's assume for a moment you're starting on a wall in the lower right-hand corner, and you apply the paint you put on the, the wall, maybe at the top end, you start there instead of the bottom. Top end, you apply the roller and you drag it down over the wall. The first 12 to 18, 20 inches of the surface of the wall has a beautiful delivery of paint. It's thick. There's no pockets. There's no porous little parts that you got to go back and roll back over top of immediately. You just roll until what? You feel like you're not getting any paint coming out anymore. So what does the painter do? He rolls right back over that same pathway to gather excessive amounts of paint that's not necessary to be in that same area. So it's going to collect more paint, evenly distribute any areas that have these little pockets where paint hasn't been distributed. So it reapplies in old areas, yes. What does that mean? In this area here, paint was, or price was offered both directions. So from this candle's high and this candle's low, the next candle opens up here. It trades back down and runs over top of what this candle's low was. And then it rallies all the way back up to this point. So it leaves what? It leaves this little area as a hole or a pocket where price did not go back over, where it went down in between this candle's low and this candle's high. This is inefficient. This right here is an inefficiency in price delivery. Price operates on a price continuum. Okay, and it's, it's a efficiency continuum, meaning that the market has to continuously offer fair value. And fair value is evolving all the time throughout the day. And every time it creates an inefficiency like this, it will seek that and go back up into it. Now, it will over-deliver, just like a paint roller will. The painter will roll back over areas where it's already had paint delivered to the wall, right? You've seen that. There's no way to do what? You can't just paint one little pathway on your wall and then come over to the left a little bit and come back down and not overlap. You want to overlap. And that's exactly what's occurring in price action because look at the range in between here. This candle's high and this candle's low. The market has traded down and it also traded up here. So in this little area here, on a micro scale, this is a small little balanced price range. When the bodies of these candles came back up into this fair value gap, identified with this little area right there in price, that little segment right there, look where the bodies go. See where it stops? The closing price on this candle is 4116.75. What's the low of this candle? 4116.75. That's perfect. That's a signature that shows you the market's algorithmic. Retail logic, nothing out there says trade with these levels like this. Because if they did that, if they knew that, they would tell you where to put trend lines at. Whereas right now, up until this moment at the time I'm talking, nobody tells you what specific price levels to drop a, a trend line on. If you ask a thousand different traders, if, say we had a, a live like a session where I was in front of a stadium of people. I don't foresee me doing this, but let's just, for the sake of argument, say that's what we're doing here. And I said, okay, everybody raise your hand if you know how to use a trend line. Of course, everybody's going to raise their hand. So yeah, yeah, this is what we do. And say I threw out a beach ball, three or four beach balls, and we bounced around until the music stopped and whatever the music stopped, whoever had the beach ball in their hand, they get to come up on stage with ICT. And I said, okay, here, here's a chart. You all have the same chart. You can't look at each other. You can't copy. Draw the trend line that's most important to you right now. What do you see? And they're all going to be different. And you wonder why retail traders are inconsistent. They have no premise behind finding consistency because they're constantly doing something different and not maintaining a rigid approach with rule-based ideas. My rigid approach to rule-based ideas are my PD arrays within the context of market structure, within a bias that's been derived by a narrative, which is also leaning heavily on a higher time frame premise, which is a weekly chart. I'm doing the same things 
all the time. But the things I'm doing are very specific, like knowing a, a very specific level. This candle's low, 4116.75. Happens to agree with the closing price on that candle. What's the next candle's body? It's the open, and it's the same thing. The open price is 4116.75. Now, just like that paint roller, when it delivers over top of old areas where it has delivered paint, watch the painter, they overlap over it. Why, they, why do they do that? It makes sure there's no seams. It buttons up everything. It, it completely smooths out and feathers the edge of an old run on paint being delivered to the wall and then you apply it back over top of it just a little bit kind of like when when gentlemen when you cut the grass the lawn you cut the grass and you come back over and you're not trying to line up where the edge of the last pass with the mower was you're going to overlap it a little bit why because you don't want to waste your time going back there again right well that's why the algorithm is coded this way it wants to efficiently go back and reprice so you'll see these little areas here which i'm going to borrow this now this area here is where this candle's low. Let me take it away a little bit further and you can see the difference. So this candle's low. Right here, this candle's low and this candle's high. High and low. It's passed back and forth between that shaded area, both directions. So when we have this pass back up into the actual fair value gap, that low to that high with this one single candle here, my eye is trained to look for that in price. I'm teaching my students to look for that too. You're going to try to enter in that. Where? Going short at that candle's high or the midpoint in between. You can, if you really want to try to be a precise you know, fanatic, you can try to get the fill at the high end. But many times I've tried to do that and it doesn't go there. It leaves a small little portion open. In this case, what I'm illustrating here is the efficiency of the algorithm coming back into an area that's already balanced, but it's covering up and overlapping an area where it's already traded to, which is why you're getting this and this. That's not an error. It's not a deficiency on precision either. It's just making sure there's no seams. Everything's been offered efficiently, but the bodies tell you the real story. This is where the damage is done, the wicks. But this real narrative and what Price is doing is you have to study the bodies. That's where the real storyline is. And you can see how it comes right up into there and stops. This part of these wicks, okay, you have to accept the fact that your trades are going to have that much drawdown. If you're entering in here in consequent encroachment, okay, in this range here, we have what? It's, it's balanced. It's done both passes. This candle went down to this low. And then this candle opened here and then went up this much. So I'm not worrying about all this here. I'm saying the difference between this candle's low and this candle's high, those two ranges pre present a range of price action that has in this interval of, what is it, four minutes? Each candle's two, two minutes. In four minutes, price has gone back and forth in there. And you, you're going to hear other people say, these lower time frame charts are, are noise. They're not noise. It's telling you what price is doing. Whether you're looking at this chart time frame or if you're looking at an hourly chart or a daily chart, if you're staring at a daily chart, is the daily chart, if you watch it from the time that the market's open at 9.30 to 5 o'clock when it closes for our hour session of you know, dead time, if you simply watch price on that daily candlestick versus – us watching on a lower time frame. Is price doing anything different? It's doing the same thing. It's this, this, you're doing the same thing, but you're using the benefit of a time-based chart. And you're going to get goobers out there that are going to tell you time-based charts don't work. Time-based charts don't work if you trade retail logic. That is true, but I don't trade retail logic. We don't trade retail logic. I'm teaching you how to use time-based theory to identify what the market algorithm, okay? There's only one algorithm. That's the price engine that delivers this. You're never going to convince anyone, especially in this community, that these things here are being met because buyers and sellers that use retail logic all come together and 
through sheer coincidence, it just happens to be perfect? Come on. It, it's No. 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 I don't even want to entertain that anymore. When I see people comment and say that stuff, I immediately mute them. I'll never see another comment from that person again. You're not being blocked from my Twitter feed, but I just don't want to hear from you because you're literally closing your eyes, putting fingers in your ears. No, 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 no. You don't want to hear it. Okay. I don't want to see your nonsense because to me, all it's going to do is trigger me. I can't stand seeing people deny, deny the evidence laid in front of them. It's right in front of them over and over and over again, but they won't appreciate it because it flies in the face of whatever they believe is the real things. And the things that you're holding on to probably isn't even this precise, which to me is madness. But I'm becoming a little too dogmatic here. Let me dial it back. So we have this overlapping into this area. What is this entire range? From this low to this high right there. Watch this. There's our fair value you got. Now, if you know that the algorithm is going to do the same thing you're going to do when you cut your lawn in the springtime, when the grass is growing, you're going to go out there with your mower or the guy that you're going to hire to cut your grass for you like I do because <laughs> I ain't cutting shit. The overlapping of that mower where you just pass through, you know, cutting the grass down the first pass, then you're going to turn the mower around or they're going to turn the mower around and they're going to lay their wheel over top of what was already cut. So that way there's no seam, right? So you, when you make a new pass, you're always cutting through, cutting through, and not leaving that little segment of grass where you got to go, oh, I left a mohawk. Got to go back in here. My sons, the few times I've asked them to do the, uh, the lawn, they hate it because they know my obsessive compulsiveness is going to force me to go to the window and see what they're doing. And I'm waiting for them to leave a little mohawk in the grass. And as soon as I see it, I'm out there. Hey, hey. Go back and get that. And they flip out because they, they thought they were going to get away with it. But you can see it. You can see it in the grass. You don't want to leave that. So that's what these little things are here, preventing any little mohawks in the lawn. I know I'm giving you all kinds of analogies, but this stuff makes sense to me. If it doesn't make sense to you, then, you know, I'm sorry. But if you look at that balanced price range between this candle's low and this candle's high, there's our target right there. Screenshot that. And that's the level I told you here, too. Pretty, uh, pretty cherry-picked, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I see T, you slay me. The range between this low and that high, if we measure that and you get a, a midpoint level, that is mean threshold. Why? Because we're measuring candlesticks that have bodies. If it were a gap like this fair value gap, the midpoint is consequent encroachment. Consequent encroachment is what is permissible within a range. Let me make this a little bit smaller. See if we get that 98.50 level I mentioned on Twitter. Because I feel like a peacock if it hits that. My wife's going to see me doing the Mick Jagger walk. Got my moves like Jagger. Don't worry, I'll come back up to that balance price range in a minute. Some of you already figured out what I'm going to go and talk about in a second. Come on. All right, we'll give it time to cook. So over here... We have 4,117.50. It just so happens, randomly, with buying and selling pressure being as it is, completely random, how far can it overshoot this fair value gap? Well, what's the, what's the midpoint between this candle's low and this candle's high for that balanced price range? 4,117.50. What's the high on this candle right there? 4,117.50. Whoops. So it takes more of a religious faith-based madness to believe that all these things that I'm teaching you, okay, all these things that I tell you to go in and look and see if they're really in the market, if they're really in the marketplace, it begs the question, how the hell does it keep happening? How does it keep happening? See, these are the things I was sitting in my aunt's bedroom after working 13 and a half hours a day, doing a 45-minute commute in 20 minutes, speeding. I guess I was breaking the law. Never wore seatbelts either, and I rarely wear one still today. But I'm a rebel. I would sit in there, and I'd look at these charts, and I started looking at these things and these turning points. And I'm like, 
what happens continuously all the time at these turning points? And I started seeing this in the bond market, in the S&P market. And then I said, well, let me see if it occurs in the currency futures. It was. It's there. So I said, okay, I need to know. I need to know. Did I see something I'm not supposed to see? So I took all of my money. Every time I made new money, I would buy more books and more courses and more books and more courses. And for the yahoos out there that say that I have rebranded things, old terminology, rebranded with new terms, this stuff is in no books. No other author ever has talked about it. It's never been touched on until I've said it, which is the reason why I challenge every one of my viewers. I'm not just going to hit our target here. One of those, um, I told you so moments. Oh, look at that. <laughs> That's so random. Acceleration down. I told you we'd probably get a big down day earlier in the day if we get through that uh, new week opening gap. So I have a lot of fun. I'm not, I'm not beating my chest. I'm just thumbing my nose at the people that like to say I can't do this, that these things don't work, and it's cherry-picked. And I had a small win when I had the win of the day. I called everything. You've seen it. It's here again. I want you to learn, but if you can't get out of your way of your own ego and your pride because you don't know this and you can't do it yet, and I'm probably killing your business because you can't sell your stuff anymore and you're getting on your live streams and losing $15,000 of fake money but calling it live, I get it. It's a struggle point for you, but I'm not trying to be your adversary. Just learn from me. You don't ever have to mention me. I just want to see you do better, and you don't have to communicate to me. If you want to keep it in private, that's wonderful. I just want to see all of you do well. Not get hurt because these markets are not random. They're not. But back to that balance price range, and we'll see what we get later on. I'm going to focus up on here. Some of you are thinking, damn it, I shouldn't have closed the trade when he did. <laughs> There's a lesson in there. So it nails that level perfectly. Then it moves lower, and it leaves this area here. One more time, it trades to it above it one more time making sure there's no mohawks in the lawn it's seamless and then it breaks lower one more time it trades up what is it going back up into consequent encroachment of this gap midpoint hits it when you see that as soon as you see that you're thinking okay this is the last time it's going to do it why because this has already went up to the midpoint of this area here and why because your targets your terminus, the levels that you're, you're expecting and looking for, that's where it's going to draw to. Just like when you're sitting down to figure out when you're going to cut the lawn, when you start making that mower pass over top of your lawn, you know you got to keep doing it until you get to the end of the lawn. Well, the end of the lawn is down here, so you got to keep constantly doing what? Apply the paint to the wall or keep pushing that mower until it goes to completion. The completion is time and price. So we're in that last hour of trading, 3 o'clock hour. The market's delivering into our objectives. The one I gave you on Twitter, we already hit it. and It went past it. That's fine. But when it goes up into this level here, you're anticipating it to do what? Never, never go back up here. It, no, it has no need to do that. But what can it do? What's permissible? It can go back inside this fair value gap because why? This is an old inefficiency in price. Whereas this, the difference between this candle's low and this candle's high here, this is efficient. What makes it efficient? It's traded both directions in between this candle's low and this candle's high. So price is effectively permitting balance in order flow in price delivery. Price delivery is... Every time there's a new price tick and there's a new fluctuation in price action, that's delivery. That, that, uh, that's the market being presented a new valuation on an asset. So what we're doing is we're measuring how often that delivery of price, how many times within a range specific to time, which is these two specific candles here, how many times has it passed through the same range of a specific number of prices? 
meaning that this candle's high here comes in at 41.18 and a quarter, 0.25. And this candle's low here comes in at 41.16.75. So between those two price points, price went down, and then this candle here opened, went up, and then went down again. So this entire range between candle high and candle low is balanced. It can go back up into the midpoint of that. That's normal. I allow for that. In my analysis, when I'm reading price, I allow for it to go up to halfway. It's rare that it will go all the way back up to the top of a balanced price range. It can. It just means that I'm probably getting ready to bail on the trade if I'm using that as a point of interest to measure if these PD arrays are able to stave off an advance or a retracement against my trade. So I'm treating these PD arrays like you are being taught to use support and resistance, but never get them to work right. Whereas the algorithm is going to go into these specific little signatures and price action that cannot be hidden from you. It can't hide it from you, folks. That should be exciting. It's not like they're going to be able to go out there tomorrow and turn off candlesticks. <laughs> we all look, are you going to stop using a clock? Raise your hand in the audience right now if you're going to say, the hell with this. I'm not using a clock. I'm getting rid of my watches. I'm never going to look at the time anymore. That's absurd. And that's the first primary function of what price does. It follows time. It does things at specific times. Then it delivers price based on the efficiency the price delivery continuum, it has to continuously offer fair value. If the market runs too quick one direction and it goes down like it does here in this one candle, is it fair? And that's probably not the best term of using for describing this, but for the sake of making it easy to understand, because fairness is not really the, the, the goal here for these markets. But if the market drops down like this, and leaves this little separation between this candle's low and this candle's high. There was no overlap, no other candle after this candle closes, no other candle printed within the price range between this candle's high and that candle's low, in between these two, these three candles. It's that small little segment of price action creates that little pocket, the little porous price action hole. It needs to be filled in. Okay, uh, think of it like a like a pothole on the road. Okay, you're going down the road, hey, boom, you just blew out your front end alignment. You're going to call the state, hey, you so-and-sos, I just tore my, my thing up. Well, where is that? What mile marker? Let me go back. I got to drive back up to it. There, there's the mile marker, and then there it is. Silly little analogies, but I use these types of things to teach my kids. And I tried to explain every possible scenario with my wife, and I still haven't figured out an analogy where it makes sense to her. She just thinks it's a video game, so... <laughs> Whatever. But the fair value gap can be revisited entirely. And that's what we see here. Notice that these wicks trade up into that same old inefficiency. Hits it here. Hits it here. All this is, is a reclaimed fair value gap. Reclaimed means it simply went back to it and treating it as you would expect a resistance level to be respecting. If it's going to go lower, it's going to do what? It's going to go up, fail, go up. Reject it and send it lower. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's exactly what you want to see. You want to see that. You should not be freaking out when the market's rallying up back to these areas here because we have this behind it, this balanced price range. This is kind of like the, the defender. Okay, It's the linebacker of price action. It's saying, you can only go so far, Jack. You're not getting through me. It's the iron wall. Okay, You're saying, no, can't get through me. So everything's coming short of that or falling short of this. Hang on one second. got to fix these. these headsets. Really uncomfortable. So if we see any kind of retracements back up into a fair value gap, that's reasonable. And you're going to see me explain this, and you're going to see your experience seeing it happen. When I'm calling specific fair value gaps and it returns back to them, sometimes it'll go through them, like we were looking at this morning. There was nothing in there for a trade, nothing, until I saw 
one fair value gap when it re retraded back. I said, okay, we're going to use the fair value, fair value gap again. I tried to take a trade on it and it just wasn't working out for me and I had to kill it and I would have stopped out and I mentioned it on Twitter if I'd have held my full stop. That's human error. You're going to, you're going to do it wrong too. You're interpreting price and you're seeing objectives. I'm also trying to teach as well. But when you see these PD arrays, you're going to learn their characteristics because you're looking at them. This is what's usually occurring when someone watches my videos. Number one, they're not interested in listening to someone really expound on the logic that's required to know how to do this. If you are lazy, and if this offends you, unsubscribe, don't ever watch me again, okay? Because this is for the people that really want to understand and learn. If you are lazy, you will not learn how to do this. There's no shortcut to it. You will go into charts. You will study. You will look at old data. You will back test. You will tape read for months and, and throughout this year. And that's how you get good at it. Here's who's going to fail. Pushing a button, getting into a trade, whether it's demo or live. You will not be able to learn this because you're not getting the same type of feedback and insight by looking at these things I'm calling out on Twitter or when I reference it, look, I just did it again in front of you here again today. Were you all here? I mean, did you see me not say, watch this volume imbalance here? And look, look what happens. It goes right up here and it perfectly delivers to this candles. What's the, clo what's the closing price on that candle? You're going to look right here, okay? This candle's closing price is 4111.75. I told you, watch this volume imbalance. Trades up until here. What's the high of that candle here? 4111.75. Perfect. Perfect, folks. Please don't come to me with this Mickey Mouse shit supply and demand. It's nothing like that. It's nothing like that. When, when students sit down with me, and when I was doing one-on-ones in uh, the late 90s, when I sat down with them and I was doing this with the bond chart and I would do it with the S&P, you should see their face. I mean, it's probably what your face looks like too when, when you're seeing it live and you watch it happen. You're, you're looking around the room like, am I supposed to know this? Like you're waiting for the knock on the door like <laughs> the men in black are showing up because it shouldn't be this perfect, right? But yet it should. If the markets were really designed for your embetterment, it should be something like that. It's an investment. But they treat it like, let's turn it into casino. Let's turn it into a casino experience where they blind you by never having windows, never a clock, because they don't want you to know how much time you've wasted losing money. So how, they, how do they hide this stuff in plain sight? Indicators, baby. Indicators. And in case you don't like the indicators they've already pushed on the masses, they're always bringing what? A new round of indicators. They're already starting to do it with my stuff. Here's a fair value gap indicator. It's bullshit. It's bullshit. You're not even bringing in the most important criteria to that. You can have a fair value gap indicator. It's going to give you every single one of them. And you're going to look at that and think what? It's overbought, oversold. It's overbought, oversold. And you're going to lose money. And you're going to say, oh, this ICT, he's a scammer. He can't ever do this live. He'll never live stream and call these moves. I'm doing it. And you're still plugging your ears and closing your eyes. The people that are learning, they're excited right now because they're seeing evidence. They're seeing a testimony every single day that the author is talking to you, baby. There's no denying it. So when you see these things repeat, like I mentioned here, the volume amounts, watch it in volume amounts. I even facetiously said, oh, you're going to tell me that that small little range? Yes. And what does it do? It overshoots it, so why? There's no mohawks in the lawn. Overshoots it a little bit, so it's seamless. Then it does what? Comes right back up. What's the what's the close? I'm sorry. What's the low of this candle here that frames the high of the volume imbalance? I know. I love you too. You're sitting there thinking, man, I love this guy. Man, I love this guy. Yes, I love you too. This is going to be an amazing year. You should be thankful that you sat down and listened because there's going to be a whole lot more of this fun shit. The low of this candle. 4109.25. Guy's thinking to himself, how the hell he just hear that? I was thinking, I didn't say that loud. He's in my head. What's the high of that candle? 
got to be on the candle this right one now. 4109.25, exactly the low of that candle. 4109.25. Folks, listen, listen. I took your attention on this live stream. It wasn't a tweet that got deleted that was incorrectly called. It wasn't something else. It was exactly that. And what did we have? We had unrealized objectives. 4101.25, which is this level here, and then the 4098.50 level, which I mentioned on Twitter. But it went further, ICT. Yeah, it's fine. I don't care. I have no, do you hear any regret? Folks, if, <laughs> if you know what I'm teaching you, and I know it, I don't worry about missing a move. The sun might not come up tomorrow. That's always a, a, a probability. It's not likely to be high probability, but you know, the world could end. Anything could happen. I might you know, go to meet my maker before I'm ready. Well, I'm always ready, but before I would expect to do it. Barring those extremes, if the market's going to open up tomorrow, I'm going to see these things occurring in price action. You're going to see them occurring. They cannot hide it from you. They can't. You should not worry about my algorithm being changed. It's not going to be changed, folks. If I honestly believed by sharing it openly like this, if it would somehow be changed or augmented, I honestly, my flesh, the sinner in me would keep it to myself. And that's the honesty. That's truth. If you can't respect that, then, you know, hit the road. But there's no reason for you to worry. You're wasting time worrying about stuff that has no bearing on your development. You're, you're, you're providing perfect excuses for you not to even start. Which gets back to one of the, the sound clouds I did. Are you deserving? Because some of you probably don't believe that you are. And that's going to be a, a, a amazing barrier to you ever getting good at this. No matter who you learn from, whatever style or, or approach to trading, you don't want to fail. Deep-rooted fear of failing. So you'll make perfect excuses to justify why you're not going to try hard. I'm, I'm just never going to be able to do it. I won't be able to follow the rules. So why bother? I just might as well call it a scam. He's a scammer. He's never going to live stream. I'm doing it now. I'm calling it. I'm telling you on Twitter, and I'm telling you here. Come on. Wake up, man. You're going to burn through this whole entire year and waste this opportunity. So, anyway. So, now let's look at it through the lens of your, your trading model is, say, it's the last hour of the day. Okay, so it's like 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. New York local time. If that's what you're trying to do, you have to understand where the market's likely to go. Where is it trying to reach? What's the what's the uh, draw on liquidity? That's the number one thing as a trader I force on my students to learn. You may not be good at it quickly. And that's the reason why I teach that premise first. Because if you start working on that as your first hurdle, that's the first thing you're trying to learn and you're doing it correctly, by time devotion doing it over and over again, the other skill sets are which are very easy, which are entering, which sounds crazy because you heard me say multiple times now, my, my hard part about trading was what? Conquering the fear of getting in. Now, my strength is getting in. Like I just, I mean, I could have said all this stuff and been wrong. I'm on live stream. I'm out here without a safety net. And the market makers can hear and see me, and they know me. Do you see them crash in the market because I said it? No. Manual intervention is always a risk. That means something's going to happen that you didn't expect, some black swan event, and boom, the market's just going to go crazy. I expect that in Forex soon. That's why I'm not trading Forex. I'm trying to be a good steward with this information and also be a good human being because I feel that that's exactly what's about to happen. You are going to trade whatever you're going to trade. I understand that. But it would be unethical for me to know what I know and not warn you. 
and that's all I've done. So I have a clear conscience. If you choose to do those markets and, they, and you get burned, I don't want to hear or read an email from you. You know, you should have told me because I have said it multiple times. I think that we're going to see something similar to when the euro and the Swissy was depegged, which is unbelievably damaging. I don't know when it's going to happen. I, I don't have a timeline for it, but I know it's soon. And I don't want to be in those markets where I could get hurt. I could very easily get hurt. And you could potentially get hurt too. That's not to say you can't lose money in this market too, because obviously you can. But uh, <laughs> the type of move that I think is going to happen in Forex is not going to be the same type of move that we would see in this. It might move in similar fashion, you know, weak, big drop down, but not to the magnitude and speed and velocity of which like a depegging was when Euro and Swissy was depegged. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it and look at that chart. Nobody survived. Brokerages, brokerages were shut down over that move. They were insolvent instantly, just like that. And you can't survive those kind of moves, folks. You just can't. So I tell you that so that way you can prepare yourself for it and not get yourself hurt. Uh, I think 4088 was the next level um, I had in my notes. I don't have them right here with me, but 4088 was the very, very last thing. And I didn't expect that really, to be honest with you. Uh, today, I was wanting to see it trade into it to tomorrow. So we'll see 4088. Tom Hugard's probably thinking, damn it, I should have held it. <laughs> Man, he had me rolling today. I've been listening to him for uh, about a week and a half. Not every day. There's a couple days where I wasn't able to listen because I was doing other things. But he sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, to me, he sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And uh, usually he's very – sounds very sophisticated, very articulate, gentlemanly. <laughs> Once in a while, he gets a little animated. And today, he really got animated. And I literally was pissing myself. I'm like laughing my ass off so much. I was tearing. I, I like, like, man, it was so funny. It was funny. And I'm, I'm not laughing at him. I was laughing with him. And then if you listen to his, his presentation, he was actually referring to me because I, I mentioned how in the, in the morning session, the market was really shitty. It was, it was crummy. It was hard to get a dial on what it was doing. And then he saw that I had, I don't know if he saw it or someone mentioned it to him and he's like, Oh yeah, yeah. you'd have to hear it to know it. But it was funny. It was really, really funny. Hang on here. What the hell is I doing here? 4088. All right. So that was the level. I'll leave it to you to take a look at your charts and find that for your homework. What is 4088? higher time frame chart that'll help you but if you're the last hour type trader okay you're not trying to be in there in the beginning of the day at 9 30 you're not trying to guess what the what the range is going to do and where's the judas swing how much is it going to move this far it, it's outside your pay grade you're not worrying about it you have no concern about it. you're not going to panic about what you missed you don't have any fear over it you're going to wait into the afternoon okay if you're going to be an afternoon session trader Okay, if that's the case, you're focusing on the market beginning at 1.30 throughout this time window here. We're going into uh, you know, the last hour, 4.30, I'm sorry, 4 to 4.15, and then the closing bell takes off. Ding, 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 ding. But it trades again still further till 5 o'clock, and then we close for an hour until 6 o'clock. There's a 40.88 level. Now, to me, I would be done. If it was a rip through this, then, you know, Good gracious, that's you know that's a huge move, but this would be it. This would where I would say this is the week. I'm sorry, this is the day range for me, and I would be content if I held anything over. If I had nothing um, taken off, every bit of my position would absolutely be off right here, and I'd be content with it. I and mean, who wouldn't be right? But if you're looking at trading in the afternoon and you want to have a really small window to focus, and you just know there's going to be setups forming. It's during the 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock hour. And a lot of my students very much like this framework for trading. Because, you're not, number one, you're looking at a very small sample set of data. 
It's concise. It's encapsulated inside of 60 minutes. And it allows you to go in and, and have the benefit of what has already happened in the day. Kind of like when I'm teaching Forex, I teach folks to focus on the New York session because they have the added benefit of having London behind them. And if they know where the market's likely to go in a higher time frame chart, they have all that guesswork of where's the high or the low of the day because most of the time it's formed in London. And then you can just trade in concert with that unfolding bias leading to a higher time frame draw on liquidity and not have to worry about getting whipsawed with getting in too soon and, and guessing where the high and low forms in London. Well, you have that similar advantage, uh, if, if, you can, if I can be permitted to use that term here, you have that advantage with the last hour of trading because it allows you to have all of the hindsight, perfect 2020 behind you in the morning session and then the lunch. And after the lunch, that first 30 minutes, the 45 minutes where there's manipulation that goes against the, the stops of the morning session. If they don't run them in the lunch hour, you anticipate that occurring at noon to 1.30 to 1.45. And that's why you want to be watching and studying price around 1.30 in the afternoon if you're going to be an afternoon trader. But if you don't want to be spending a whole lot of time, you can start your session at like 2.45. Come in front of your charts, take those 15 minutes to go through, see what we've done. What is it reaching for? You have to know where the draw on liquidity is. Where is it drawing to? What's the, where's that overwhelming magnet that's being used to tug at price? It's going to gravitate towards. You're going to find that on your daily chart, your four hour and your one hour chart. That's where you're going to be finding the highest probability draws on liquidity. The direction of movement that you're trying to trade within is using a weekly chart. Is it more likely to expand higher or expand lower? You're not trying to predict that closing price on the weekly chart. By having all those things compressed into this small little one hour time frame, if you know where it's likely to draw to, you're going to focus on only looking for PD arrays, fair value gaps, institutional order flow entry drills, breakers, order blocks, fair value gaps, balance price ranges, mitigation blocks, everything that I teach on my YouTube channel, whatever one of those PD arrays that you find easiest to use, it makes the most sense, it resonates with you. But what happens if the, that PD array doesn't form? Well, here's a news flash for you. You're going to miss the trade. Get ready for it. I miss trades. I'm, I've talked this entire thing right here, and I didn't push the button in front of you. I knew it was likely to deliver, but I want you to do what? I want you to see it. Let me be able to communicate over top of why it's, while it's doing it. I gave you two reference points for where potential turns would occur if this market was, in fact, going to keep going lower. I told you to watch the volume and balance here. Perfect delivery. What does that mean, delivery? It delivered perfectly to a level where it should stop, which is this closing price. And it does so here on that candle. Perfectly. Not one tick short, not one tick over. And I said, watch this little small range in here. And I facetiously said, there's no way the market's going to care about that little tiny range. No, the market doesn't care about that. But the algorithm does. Because there is an algorithm. Whether you choose to believe me or not, I could sit in front of a courtroom, judge, jury. People can sit in front of me and, and watch me do this every single day. And I'm going to show you every single day that this is what it's doing. But you're looking at your RSIs. You're looking at your indicators. And that's the distraction. That's why you don't see it. It's literally, that's the misdirection. That's the, you can't see the magic because you're watching the misdirection in the hand and never seeing the real, real work. You're looking over here at this hand when the match is done over here. Just like a magician. That's what they've done. And they keep everybody engaged in that type of approach. And it's right under your nose. It's been here all this time. It's been here. It can't, you can't hide. You can't hide it. It's right there. Go back and look at charts from the 1930s. It's there. But wait a minute. There wasn't an algorithm. Right. There were people that were sitting around, literally, working together to make sure these markets booked this way. Well, how's that happening? That's another discussion, but I promise I'll give it to you before we close this year out. 
Mr. Smith. <laughs> You're going to know him. So the last hour trading, uh, 3 o'clock, we have the run-up into what? The volume imbalance. So that starts the show. Do we get respect of that level, and does it hold back price? Yes, it does. It starts to go lower. What are we looking for next? What's the next clue? Um, I'm going to have to, un unfortunately, take this out of the presentation because I want to be able to zoom in here and talk about this. I think I've already proven enough here today. And again, if not, then you know, go watch uh, Carl's Futures in introductory course on YouTube. The uh, swing low here, we do what? We trade through it and come back up into what? A fair value gap? Well, there's one here. But what's below that? Before we get to this fair value gap, after this swing low is taken right there, but it didn't close below it. I never said it had to. Go back and watch what I teach as a market structure shift. All it needs to do is pierce. But what if it's only by one tick? It pierced it. That's all it is. It's you're letting you're literally going in and you're waiting for this swing low. Why this swing low? Because we've already went into what? That volume imbalance. With the expectation that we're going to trade trade to 4098.50, which is the last public reference that I gave on Twitter. I think it's 98.50. If it ain't 98.50, it's 98.25. So you'll have to check me on that one. But I know I tweeted it. So we're looking for the markets to gravitate lower. We were expecting the, the large range day. I told you we would get a big large range day if we got through what? The new week opening gap. Did it deliver? Sure it did. Did I have majority of the position open the entire day? Yes, but I missed this big runoff. That's okay. I've outlined where those signals were here in front of you. Volume imbalance, we trade up into it. We create a swing low here. We rally up, hit it one more time. What's it hitting? What's this candle's high here? 4109.00. Trades back up to this level here on this candle's high. What is the high in here? 4109.00. Oops. Perfect. Perfect. Let that, let that sink in for a second, folks. Do you really believe that there's other books, other educators and teachers that was teaching this anywhere before I mentioned it? Because I'm going to tell you something. It did not ever happen. Ever. And you'd be surprised that some of those big name authors, they have been talking to me in private for Three and a half years, four years now. Yep. You're going to see all kinds of future books from other people, but it was never before this. And it's important to me. What does it matter? Who cares? It matters to me. It matters to me. And if it is a source of contention with us, me being a mentor, me constantly repeating it, it's because I have to. I have to do it. It's like a nervous tick in me. I gotta, I gotta do it. It's the mosquito bite. I gotta keep scratching it. And you're gonna have to get over it because I'm not gonna stop. So when we trade up into that volume imbalance, we wanna see it do what? Respect it and repel price away. So when that candle closes and the next one opens, we're looking for no return back to what? Where they removed any mohawk in the lawn. No little seam. So it can go back up and bump that volume imbalance once more. It could easily go up in and trade consequent encroachment too. That's absolutely permissible. But going above this high, not permissible. So it's building barriers. How do you trust the ICT to, to leave the stop where you put it at? And now how do you know that the market's not going to go past? I'm teaching that right now. But you're sitting here worrying about other things. You're not taking notes. You're not listening. You have to write this stuff down. Who knows when I'm going to talk about it again? I have so many other things to talk about this year. And frankly, you know, I'm like a fire hose. I don't know what I've said after I've said it. It's just so many things coming out. And because I'm talking about something that's live in, in real time, who knows what, what memories is going to be brought up and what I'm going to use as a framework to say, okay, this is what you want to be focusing on. 
not because the logic is going to be different, but because it's in my nature to be a rambler. And I ramble. So let's get rambling. This turning point here is confirmed when this candle fails to make a higher high to that one or even touch back into that volume of balance. And then this candle's low is taken out on that one. When we see that, I'm expecting, and when I'm watching things like this in price action, when you watch my recordings, I'll say, okay, I expect speed and distance right now. Or I'll type in, uh, it's going to drop hard or a sharp drop now. That's what I'm looking for. We would be getting that here. So we now have this low taking out. This is going to act much in the same way that this candle here being pierced here. It's like a small little shift in market structure. It's an early confirmation that this is most likely going to get tripped. So it prepares you to get ready. So this candle drops below this low. We're looking for this low to be pierced. It does. So now we have a valid shift in market structure with this low being taken there. Yes, you would frame this as a fair value gap, but you don't know when this candle opens and how it closes that creates this, what, volume imbalance. So in my mind, I'm going to use this volume imbalance on this candle here. If it opens here, as soon as it rallies up into that between this candle's open and this candle's close, as soon as it trades there, right then and there, while that candle is bullish, it's green, it's a bullish candle, I'm going right in there, selling short. That's how I would use that entry technique. Oh, but you didn't do it, ICT. You're cherry picking. Look at all the examples. I'm selling short in up candles. I'm pyramiding entries when I'm bearish in up closed candles. When the candle's forming, going up, I'm selling into that. How do you know to trust it? I'm explaining it here. You have to know those PD arrays that I'm teaching you to look at and observe and study. You don't know which one you're going to trust. I trust all of them. They're mine. you don't trust them yet so my question i usually retort when i do take the time and it's very rare um, somebody will send me a message send me an email send me a message through trading view or say something to me on uh, on uh, twitter you know how do you trust this and I'm, look what do you look for in my pd arrays which one are you using and it's crickets they won't answer because they haven't done the work. You have to sit down and look at real-time data and figure out which one you like and be content with the idea that, okay, every price run isn't going to have your specific PD array. In the beginning, that's actually a good thing because it teaches you to be patient and also to be highly selective about the trade setups that you're looking to participate in. It, it doesn't allow you to overindulge, which is very very problematic in this industry because you can overindulge and blow your account. You can have a high success and strike rate and overindulge with leverage and be done in one trade and be blown out. But your strike rate's 90% and you can blow your account on one trade. Being overzealous about building up a large position, pyramid, 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 pyramid. It happens on YouTube. There's a talker out there doing it just about every other time he gets on the live stream. Max loss day, boom, $15,000, $16,000, if it's even real. You can't control yourself. Pyramiding and build big positions, that's not the answer. You have to know what you're looking for, what PD array you're going to dial in on, and make that your model. Learn that one well. And then when you're comfortable seeing it always forming in the setups that you're looking for, being content with them not always being in every price run, meaning that when there's a move that, well, something like this to here to here, there isn't any necessity for every one of my PD arrays or the things I use to get into trades with and also measure institutional order flow, keeping the idea that we're moving in the right direction. Not all of them are going to form in that price run, and it's okay. I'm not limited like a new student or a new trader learning this is. But don't look at that as a limitation that is always going to be there. You have to grow. And you only do this correctly by watching price action without pushing a button, observing, saying, oh, 
this makes a lot of sense to me. Some of you might be looking at this thing and think, there's no way on God's green earth I would ever look at that as a cell. Okay. It doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It doesn't mean that other students aren't going to not be profitable doing it. This means that you haven't warmed up to that specific PD array. Yours would be the fair value gap, and you would not have been filled there. And there's going to be many times, because I see it all the time, there's moves that I miss. I would like to get a part of it, but I don't because I'm looking for a very specific level. I want, I want the market to come to me. If there's a very specific level I'm looking for and it doesn't trade there, I miss it. Then I have to go into the move that's already on its way. And as long as I'm not trading outside of that PDRA matrix where I defined uh, last night where y you don't want to trade beyond a certain measure, you have to do all your core entry at that point or above if you're short and in deference to being long. And you're probably, if this is the first video you're listening to, what I'm saying here has no understanding. There's no basis to frame what I'm saying. And it sounds like mumbo jumbo, but it's exactly what I taught last night. You have to have a limitation on when are you going to stop taking entries? When does it become less probable? When are you going to stop adding in your pyramid position? You have to have that criteria in your trading. Otherwise, you'll just treat everything as a reason to get in there because it hasn't gone to your target yet. And I learned that lesson the hard way. It turned against me even when I had a really nice winning trade. And I was doing inverted pyramids where I would start with one contract, then two, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32, 64. Well, it means every time I added new entries, the position size was exponentially larger than the previous one. So it would only take a small little retracement to have my open profits be evaporated and more or less eviscerated. <laughs> and I'd still wouldn't have much of a retracement in terms of price, but the price movement with a large position most recently built in small little retracement back on me wiped out the entire run of previous open profits on my earlier positions on that one singular singular trade. So there's a lot of things that you have to weigh out. And you want to know how to pyramid. You want to learn how to run these accounts up. You want to be able to see big, massive equity increases and all that stuff. Okay, I, I can appreciate your interest and enthusiasm in that. But you have to start at square one. So let's go down here and see how far it went down before it turned around like that. <clears throat> What's that, 78.75? 78.25 is the low. So there you go. That was a nice run today. Good grief. One second. All right. So when the market pierces this low here, this would be my original entry. What happens if it would have traded up in that fair value gap? I would have added more. But you're adding to a losing position. No, I'm not. I'm building a position within a small little segment of price action below an area where I don't think it's going to go back to, which is what the volume imbalance. So I'm framing the logic of, yes, I would enter on this volume imbalance as soon as it went into it. But what happens if I didn't have that volume imbalance? I'd be trading into this area here. So I'm putting in my largest position initially here. So if I go in with, say, six contracts here, then I'm going to add what? In this area, I would add three. I'm cutting the original position size and leverage in half. And then as the market breaks down, we see it trade below these lows. We have a lot of energy here, and it comes back up and closes here. I want to see this immediately overlap that wick. Why? Why would I want to see that? What have I been teaching you about consequent encroachment in wicks? Midpoint of that gap can act as what? Support and resistance. So we do not want to see this candle open, come back down, flirt with this midpoint here, and then start to rally back up. That's not what you want because what that's occurring, where it's occurring doing it, is below old lows. And what that means is it could very well retrace back up in the human error of not thinking that you're going to have that fair value gap traded to. It could do there. could do it right there. And then had it done that, then I would consider, well, I can put on one contract and then hopefully not see this uh, volume balance retraded to and get stopped out. But that's the risk that you open yourself up to. 
How do you know? You don't really know. It's just you've been doing it for so long, you use the logic that repeats over and over again most times, not all the time, most times, and then you trust that experience. So in this case here, this candle opens, delivers, and re-delivers this entire range of that wick. And we close lower and have a lower low than that one. So everything's good. Then we open down here, we have a volume imbalance. We trade lower, then we retrace back up. Midpoint of that gap, consequent encroachment. Now think. What do you see here? I swear, I wish I had this when I was coming up. I, I could literally sit here and watch this. Like, if someone was talking like this, I could watch them all day long. Like, I love this. Like, I love price action. I love analysis. I love being in it. This wick here, we measure that. So that's consequent encouragement at 4100.75. What's the open on this candle here? I'm sorry, I said open. What's the close on that uh, candle? 4100.75. That's that's consequent encouragement. And the open on this candle is the same thing, 4100.75. Okay, big deal, right? But it goes up a little bit. Why is it doing that? Remember, it's to make it seamless. It's not going to go and bump up right to the old lows exactly all the time. Because if it was like that, number one, I believe it would have been more easily observed by other people. They hide it by having this little bit of an overlap. Because if it always stopped in the middle of the wicks like this, people would have it in books. Years ago, it would have been books. It's not. It's not in books. Here's your algorithm kicking in at uh, 10 minutes to 4. There's buy side right here. The uh, So you have a volume imbalance here. I would use that here and allow for price to trade up into consequent encroachment of this wick. So this would be a point of adding more. And then if it could get to consequent encroachment, I would add more there too. But you're adding to a losing position. No, I'm not, because I will be net short from up here in this volume imbalance, and I have, I have all this position here with the largest portion on initially in that volume imbalance there. So six contracts short here. It trades down, comes back up, volume imbalance, three contracts. One contract, consequent encroachment. Where would I not want to see price trade to now? The middle of this up-close candle, because that's your bearish order block, up-close candle, prior to this move lower. So there's displacement after that. We've taken out that low. There's no need to come back to this level if it's going to go to those 40, 98.50 level I mentioned on Twitter. So it's allowing, you're allowing, you're reading the tape, you're reading order flow, you're weighing out whether or not that the market continuously keeps balancing and repricing, balancing, repricing. So it's permissible for it to trade up to this level here. It does so. So now what has happened right there? From here to here. i got to change the color of this. We had this range back and forth between this candle's high to this candle's low. We trade all the way back up to this candle high, and then we leave the range here. There's no necessity to enter back into this range if that target 4098.50 is in fact, here's your buy side I just told you I was going to reach for, the target of 4098.50. So because this is a balanced price range, why doesn't it have the necessity for price to come back up into that pink area? Why shouldn't it go up there? Because the price has done what? It's delivered paint down, then up, then down. Buying and selling pressure had nothing to do with it not going back up into that level. It didn't even come back to touch the bottom of the range, which is this old low here, which is what? Classic support and resistance, right? Classic support and resistance. Support broken, turns, resistance. Well, you missed the party. See you later. Consequent encroachment of the wick, that's where 
algorithmic smart money composite men engage right there. And we don't need it to come back up here because this candle went down to this low. And the next candle it happens to be opening up here and delivers once more over top of that range. So what's occurring here? This balance range, balance price range, yes, it's it's balanced, but now we have a smaller balance, uh, balance price range here. It doesn't need to come back up into this area. It trades lower and then trades over top of it here again. We leave that range and we come back up. What can it do? What's permissible? Halfway. Halfway, which is also consequent encroachment of that wick. There's a convergence of factors coming there. When I'm looking at price, my eye's looking at all these things and I'm reading everything from each one of these candles. Now imagine what I've already said here. How much time would it take me to annotate that in a chart? Typing it out. I can't. Not when a one-minute chart and I'm trying to read it and, and decipher all that stuff. I can't do it. So when you're watching price, you're looking at it and you're deciphering, does the feedback that you're getting from price supporting the idea that it, want, that it wants to keep going lower? The fact that we don't go back up into this area is great. The fact that the bodies are respecting the consequent encroachment of that wick and the mean threshold, because we're measuring bodies of candles here, both consequent encroachment and mean threshold converge at the same area, which is this level right there. Look. forty one zero zero point seven five. That's the close and open of that candle. The small little variance in price, you have to allow for that. Don't let that scare you. Don't let it be a, a source of fear or anxiety. That's normal. That's a normal thing in price delivery. Get this off here. So now price goes up into that area. We want to see, and I would be saying if we were doing a live trade, I'd say we want to see it deliver and go lower now. It goes down. So what's it doing here? It takes out this low here. So now this low to this high here becomes what? A balanced price range because the market has delivered both directions of buy side and sell side between this here, the, our old range, down to this low here, the market trades back up to what? Consequent encroachment. So consequent encroachment becomes the high end of the new balance price range because we've, we've traced back that far. There's no need to worry back to, the, back to here or this old low. It's, it's already done its work by going back and forth between these two candles. Think about that pain analogy. Are you going to paint the same section of the wall five times? No, you're wasting paint. Price isn't going to waste time. Time is important to it. It only has so many trading hours in the day. So you take your eye and your attention. You, you don't want to do this when price is trading live because you'll miss what you're supposed to be focusing on. But you want to be referring to it while watching price. So again, we're thinking... I'm sorry, I, had to, I thought my son was calling me. The, uh, we're thinking that the price is going to continuously go lower. The market trades back up into this consequent encroachment here, which is now the new high of the balance price range. There's no necessity for it to trade higher. Does the willingness of price reflect wanting to go lower? Yes, it does. It takes out this low here, and then we come back up. What's permissible? If this is a balance price range, it's painted price down, offered sell side, then it offered buy side to the area where we're expecting to see price go to anyway, then it should go lower. It does. It leaves that price range. Can it go back up into this range? Yes. How far? Halfway. Because we're measuring bodies, we're looking at it through the lens of what? Mean threshold. Man, I should have charged you money for this. <laughs> so here is the mean threshold, 4097.50. That's what could reasonably be traded to, and it's permissible. It means it's allowed. You can expect that, and it doesn't upset anything. The market fails to go there, and what does it do? It trades lower than that low now. So we're expanding our range, and it breaks lower. 
we don't even need to go back up to consequent current, I'm sorry, mean threshold. We're looking for now any further advancement lower. What does this area here now become? Between mean threshold, which was never hit, this to so this is your new balance price range. Does market want to trade away from that? It does. But now we're late in the day. What time of day? 15, 24. So it's 24 minutes after 3, New York local time. It's going to run. It's going to aggressively reach to the liquidity it's going to aim for for the day. It aggressively runs. Trades to whatever 40, 78 and a quarter becomes. I don't even know what that is off the top of my head. In my notes, I don't have anything that jogs my memory to that. It hits it at what time? 15.34. So 34 minutes after 3. And then 20 minutes to 4. You want to be sitting and waiting for price to run on liquidity because at 15 minutes of, if you haven't already seen it by then, it's going to really aggressively run on liquidity that has not seen or hasn't been uh, tapped into. Meaning what? I told you the buy side liquidity would be right here. Where does it go? Right there. And now we're in a time of day where it's just going to trade listlessly now between this high and that low. And simply because the market's moving around and fluctuating and it ain't 5 o'clock yet, retail traders are going to try to trade in that and get caught up in a mess. When the only thing it's done is it's created the low, we come off the low, and it, it, it does its simple macro. It repeats over and over and over and over again. But reading price and understanding the order flow is essentially what I've shown you here. Every time we have an overlap of price. If sell side's offered, it means it's going down, a down candle. If you're bearish, you want to see that down close candle be re-delivered with an up close price movement and then back down it does not need to close it doesn't need to close with an up candle if it was a recent down close candle so what do I mean by that um, it will be an example of that uh, all right say uh, see how we have this down close candle here say the next candle opened up and we traded up and overlapped all of that and then went down and made a lower low, and so it would have a wick there. That's the same thing as what I'm saying. Is It has to have both, every range between one price level and another to be, there, to be determined and deemed efficiently delivered is between both price points, between any price point range in a price run, it has to offer both directions. It went down and up. Down, then up. Or if it starts with up first, it's up, then down. And it has to overlap the entire range of whatever has been delivered. So that's what I've walked you through here. Unless someone does what I just did, you don't know what I'm talking about. And these other folks out here trying to pretend they know what I'm teaching, they have no idea what they're talking about. Because they're never doing that in their videos. They're never explaining what it is that makes the market efficient or inefficient. If the market trades back and forth between price points that are defined as I'm teaching you, if they deliver both directions, that's efficiently delivered price. When it doesn't do that, it creates these things like this, where you have a separation from one candle's low, one candle down, the next candle is a lower high than the previous candle's low on these three candles here. So a fair value gap is three candles. The identification of the inefficiency is always the candle in the middle, and you define it by the candle prior and the candle after. And that segment of price action in between becomes your fair value gap. Okay, so that's your fair value gap. It does not mean, just because we go up here like we did here, is that a short? No. Why not, ICT? Because it's a fair value gap, you should be selling short there. I should be able to do a, a pyramid entry there. Well, why, no, you shouldn't. And why would you want to add or enter a, a position that's been going down all day long at 11 minutes to 4? You don't want to do that. 
you never want to feed afternoon market reversals like this that close to 4 o'clock because many times it'll ramp up against you because what? It's going to want to induce short covering. Why? Why would they want to do that? Because they want to have order flow coming in so they can, the composite man, can use that order flow to balance books. There's commerce coming in. It's not just all speculation. There's transactions that are coming in all the time. If I'm, I'm talking about currencies here. I'm sorry. Uh, like if you're looking at trade in the currency market, but they're going to use specific times of the day, like London close, between 10 o'clock in the morning, New York local time, to noon, New York local time. They'll use that little window of time to facilitate order flow coming in. And that London close condition allows all of the new volume coming into the marketplace, short covering or uh, selling longs. That order flow, they use that for the commerce aspect of Forex. So again, it's not all just speculation and traders like us sitting around trying to make money on different fluctuations in price. Sometimes it's just real business needs when it's relating to uh, currencies. And I think that is going to be it, folks. Um, I gave you an example here live. This is my second live stream. I gave you two points of reference. The volume of balance here and the volume of balance here. And I think that will suffice for this week. Um, it would be an encouragement to me if you would uh, give me some feedback on Twitter. You're welcome to say whatever you want to say, but when you say something that's derogatory or disrespectful, uh, I'm not going to block you, but I will mute you. So I won't ever see anything you're saying. Other people can see what you're saying, but I don't care to, care to see it. But if I was a source of uh, education and insight, and encouragement this week. I would greatly appreciate that. I'll be looking through those tweets uh, this weekend coming up. I'm not signing off, obviously. We have tomorrow's trading, and I'll probably be tickling your Twitter tomorrow, <laughs> driving you nuts and your boss nuts too. But I think this has been a pretty profitable week in terms of learning, teaching. I feel good about what was shared with everything. I'm happy with uh, what has delivered its price. And I'm going to close this one here and wish all of you a very pleasant evening, morning, wherever you're at. And until I talk to you next time, be safe.